Hello and welcome to Reawakening the Sacred Self, finding the way back to our ancestral soul. So we have gathered together Indigenous elders, wisdom keepers, spiritual teachers, healers, visionaries and inspirational speakers to share their wisdom and insights as to how we can live a spiritual life that also enhances and strengthens our relationship with Mother Earth, who is the guardian of our ancestral soul. My name is Frances Billinghouse, your host and creatrix of this event, and I'm coming to you from Ghana country, where the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains are the traditional custodians. So, Mani Mapadni, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'm delighted to welcome Sarita Dieste. Welcome, Sarita. Thank you very much for being part of this event. Francis, it's lovely to be part of this and also to be talking to you. Very much likewise. For anyone who is not familiar with her work, Sarita is an author, researcher, publisher and polythesis. She has been leading ceremonies, teaching and writing about magic, mysticism, mythology and witchcraft since the 1990s. Today her work is is informed by her lived Orphic beliefs in an understanding rooted in Gnosis, as well as her pilgrimages to many sacred sites, temples, and other places of worship all around the world, including India, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and even further afield to Southern Africa and Brazil. Wonderful. She lives on a hill in Glastonbury, a town famous for its religious diversity and legends about King Arthur, Avalon, and early Christian legends. In a house that she shares with her teenage son and fluffy white cats. The title of Cerise's talk is Polythesis, I can barely pronounce that, and the devotion in the modern age. So, Sarita, I am very excited to be talking to you today. Your own spiritual journey has been deeply rooted in spiritualism and Gnosis and ventured into areas that may not be all that familiar with members of our audience. So, if it's all right with you, why don't we begin first with what is Polythesium and what has attracted you? Mm. So polytheism is the belief in many gods and spirits. So it means that I don't believe in just one god or goddess or spirit. I believe that there are many spirits inhabiting the entire world, the entire cosmos above, below, the whole hog. So when we talk about the gods of a particular nation, you know, often... I guess in our kind of circles, people are attracted to ancient Egypt. So you've got the gods like Thoth and Isis and Hathor and the lion-headed Sachmet, or people talk about Greece and you've got, you know, Demeter and Zeus and Persephone and Hermes, Dionysus, and of course Hecate. Um, for me, all of these deities are separate entities that have their own stories their own kind of role in the cosmos, their own place, their own kind of abilities to keep things in balance or to enact certain types of changes. But I also believe in the spirits of place. So there's the spirits of the ancestors where they lived, maybe the spirits of the land, of the rocks, of the rivers, of the mountains, every single natural kind of place having its own spirit of place or genus loci as well so basically it means that my spiritual life is filled with many many different things it's never boring <laughs> certainly doesn't sound like that how did you become aware of all these different aspects of god of mm. spirit where did it actually start because a lot of us come through i suppose these names through mythology to start off with but yeah. believing that they are forms of deity is never taking that 
story to another level. It is taking it to another level. Um, so you are in the Southern Hemisphere, and you, as you know, um, I was also raised in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I was born in Cape Town in South Africa to a family with many different <laughs> roots, very complex. And as a child, I had developed this deep interest in the natural world through mostly my grandfather and my grandmother's influence on me. They did a lot of gardening. My grandmother in particular had a deep interest in literature and kind of introduced me to things that maybe wasn't so normal in the circumstances that I found myself in, in um, basically on the southern tip of Africa. But there's a lot of belief in animism that just surfaces underneath all the kind of different Christian faiths that have grown up in that part of the world. And a lot of people that are deeply both religious and superstitious, there's these two things that kind of come together. And I guess that friction between the different worlds, between the many different cultures represented in that part of the world, both European, but also, of course, the indigenous African religions of which there are many and many kind of variants and adaptations of, of Christianity. Just kind of awakened in me the idea that maybe there was more to life than just having one thing, you know, there's, there's all these different things and maybe there was truth in all of them. Um, I was very lucky to meet some really good teachers that introduced me into the kind of mystery side of one of the pagan traditions. And when I moved to the UK in my very, very early 20s, I happened on other teachers, on other groups, on other opportunities to continue learning. And it's through that experience and talking with so many different people around the world, um, both when I was younger, when I was maybe still forming my opinion, that I kind of started realizing that my beliefs were really that these things were separate, not that they were necessarily never overlapping because there are many examples of different traditions coming together and these fusions happening. Just like I said in Africa, the kind of animism kind of mixing in with some aspects of Christianity or the indigenous cultures, which I'm sure you see a little bit of in, in Australia and New Zealand as well. Um, and certainly you see that in Brazil, you know, where things just, they, they influence each other naturally. But I do believe that these things are separate and that there's truth to be found pretty much in all the world religions. Um, and that some of them just suit me, my circumstances, my particular interests, my particular, if you like, talents or urges for things that I want to do a little bit better. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that. So just sort of expanding upon that concept of many gods, of deity, in our modern world, it seems to be rather atheistic. It's a very science-driven mm. world that tends to dismiss what you're talking about, these animalistic spirits and the supernatural and anything that's not really proven by science. So how mm. do you, going by the subject of our talk, you're wanting to talk about devotion. So how does this devotion to the divine, whether we call it God, goddess, spirit, mm. how does that, and why is it important in so our I modern think, world? I think, you know, to use the metaphor, we're at a crossroads as a mm. civilization, aren't we? And, we, and I think increasingly over the last few years with everything that's been happening in the world, people have become aware of the fact that things that we, that appear to be quite solid and quite definite, if you like, is maybe not quite as easy to manage, you know? So when nature decides to do something, we are actually quite helpless, you know? So when, we can't move around when we can't um, function like we normally do. I guess it forces us all into kind of like rethinking the reality that we find ourselves in. And it's perhaps for that reason that during the last few years, so many more people sought out different religious paths and, and spiritual practices and knowledge. I've, I've definitely seen a kind of huge increase in that in my own work 
and I'm assuming that it's a little bit of that everywhere. Um, I think that science is a great thing. I think we need to continue on with science. Science obviously have great applications in the world. Science can be used to heal, to improve things. But as with everything, <laughs> um, and religion included, some things are an evolution where things become better. Some things maybe it's more of a devolution. And I think the increase in atheism or the loss of belief in something greater than what we are has led to some form of hubris that humans seem to have where we seem to think that we're the top of the food chain we can do anything we want and i think that having a respect for nature having a respect for the world for the cosmos that we live in is an incredibly important part of being human understanding that the sun, the moon, the, the earth itself, the even the winds and the tides of the oceans serve us on one level, you know, they provide for us, but on another level, they are also dangerous, they're unpredictable, they're primordial, they are more powerful than we are. And so spending time in devotion even just in a kind of really basic sense, just respecting the world around you and offering thanks, even if you don't believe that it's, you know, a physical entity that's going to smite you or anything like that, because not all polytheists necessarily believe that. Um, but I believe having this kind of slight devotion, quite slight reverence, if you like, for nature or the the, the things that we find in nature, whether we personify them as gods and spirits or whether we just say the earth, that tree, the ocean. I think when we've got that reverence for something and when we understand that that thing is greater than us, but that we are also reliant on that thing, you know, if the oceans went away, we'd be in trouble. If the earth went away, I don't know, I think trouble would be a kind word to use the winds that even a tree can cause a lot of damage, but a tree can also provide food for us or firewood for us. So we are reliant on those very things. So I think having that reverence and devotion for nature and for the things in nature, whether we name them as individual spirits or just as the thing themselves, um, leads to a greater respect and an understanding of our place in the natural world and the role that we can play in keeping that balance that is so necessary to re-establish at this time and just cultivating that respect that i think most of our ancestors had regardless of which religion they signed up for you know, understanding that we do need to replenish the soil, we do need to plant fruit trees for the future. Um, it's all part of a, a cycle of life that I think having some belief, some spiritual practice, some belief in something greater is, is an important part of helping to restore. Mm. My mm. opinion. No, that, that's fine. I don't think you're alone at all with those thoughts. I often think when we hear about the increase in particular say mental health with anxiety mm -hmm. depression whether that's got something to do with our continual disconnect to the earth how we treat mm -hmm. the not only just the earth but the planet as a whole all its other species our relationship that we aren't as you said top of the food chain that we are just so interconnected and we've sort of been reminded of that in the last couple of years that we aren't the you know, ruler of all mother nature came back very quickly reclaimed <laughs> what was hers when us humans were locked away and i think that was very humbling those of us who were paying attention to that but you did mentioned something that i just thought i might want to sort of expand upon and hear your thoughts on it due to your extensive um, visitation and pilgrimages all around the world mm. and that's the comment that we often hear that our distant ancestors had a deeper connection 
with Mother Earth and what we did today. Now, have you noticed that or um, any proof of that of going by um, the sites that you've lived in, what you've visited, mm -hmm. and also living in Glastonbury, a town renowned for the myths and legend of the mystical and the sacred nature? Is this the same statement that you would agree with, that our ancestors did have a more Absolutely. deep connection? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that I was in Turkey this year, actually, I was I was very, very struck, sorry, not this year, last year, in September, I went to meet up with two different groups of people around the autumn equinox and also um, spend time going to a lot of archaeological sites most of them for the first time a couple of them were revisits but you know they were on the route and they're special to me already from previous visits um but when i was in turkey uh, there was this phenomenal thing many people will know that 2022 was the year of entirely unheard of temperatures in europe but in asia minor which is where turkey is and you know anatolia the kind of asian side they also had, you know, a lot more heat, which is, I think, just something that's happened in recent years, especially last year. And as a result, the, some of the hotels I stayed at, and this doesn't sound anything to do with nature, but just hear me out. Um, some of the hotels I stayed at inland didn't have running water. Okay, there was no running water, um, like nothing to brush your teeth with, nothing to have a shower, nothing to flush the toilet, <laughs> no water. And it wasn't just one place, it was several places this happened. And what struck me during that part, it was like for about a week, it was like really hit and miss whether I could have a shower when I went back to my hotel after a really, really dusty day, um, crawling around very dry archeological sites, was that at the archeological sites, they were often running water because those ancient cities were built where there were sources of water and the water was often thought of as being sacred. Um, one of the sites I went to is a place called Lubranda and Lubranda is where we get the Labrys Axe. So those of you familiar with, um, or listeners familiar with um, the Greek mysteries, Hellenism, will know that there is a kind of double axe that appears on a, as a motif on lots of things. If you go to Crete in the Museum of Heraklion, there's some amazing um, historical examples going back many thousands of years. So Labranda is where Zeus was worshipped as um, with this symbol of the double axe, the double headed axe. And it's a fascinating site. It was completely deserted. It was just me and I found this absolutely bonkers guide to take me there because most taxi drivers were like what 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 do you want to go and do that anyway i managed to get um somebody through a recommendation who took me around quite a few of the sites that clearly no tourists went to and there was nobody else there except a farmer tending to his pomegranate trees or something when we went there and it was dry and desolate, it's like on the side of a, of a hill up in the mountains. And it's an incredible site because the, its history goes back at least 3000 years, if not more. And it's all centered around a fountain water that came up spring, if you like, that came up through a crack in the rocks. It's this enormous rock at the back of the temple complex. And it looks like it's been struck by lightning. And of course, Zeus is the god of thunder and lightning for those people. And this may, this cult maybe were around a kind of more ancient Carrion, which is the tribe that lived in that particular part of Turkey before it became um, Greece and then later Rome and now Turkey. Um, it's, a, it's a region with so much turmoil, isn't it? With so many changes. But out of this rock, came water and you know they believed that zeus struck the rock with thunder lightning and that water appeared and that it kind of created the sacred site around it and what was fascinating is my hotel had no water nada but the the, the spring there was flowing so strong that the farmer had some buckets and things that he was filling up right at the bottom to obviously take off home of the clean water coming through, you know, kind of a pipe 
underneath the temple complex, like out onto the road. And when we got to the top where the rocks were, because we had to climb around a little bit like goats, the water was everywhere. It was like mud. You know, the whole hillside there was just wet. It was lush. The vegetation was growing up around it. And so our ancient ancestors understood the need for that water. They considered that water sacred, a gift from God, quite literally. Zeus, of course, just means God. And they didn't venerate the water, but they respected it. They respected the spirits of the, the place, the God that gave it to them. Because without that water, they had nothing. I mean, the hotels had to bring in bottle and plus water in plastic containers for us to brush our teeth with. You know, whereas if you lived out onto the site, you would just have a constant flow of fresh, clean water coming up from the earth all through the year. And every single temple site you go to, there is something like that. There's usually a water source, usually some arable land, some natural phenomena that, that makes it possible for people to live in that place. And it's usually attached to the religion of that place as well. Um, and of course, sometimes they had harbors that got silted up over the years and then they moved their cities, you know, because they lost that access to, I guess, you know, the fish that they were eating or the transport that they had into the world. So always there's a source of water or some natural resource that provides for the people. There's a much deeper centering of religion around these resources that literally keep us alive. You see that again and again. Yes, especially if you're living in Glastonbury, you have a bachel as well. With, well, um, yes. yes, and that's renowned. And, and again, the sacredness of that water crosses all, all religious and spiritual beliefs as well. It's, it's, it's water is, you know, it's, it's a cliche, but it's literally one of the major building blocks of life and of our bodies and of the world around us. And, and it's important. It's something people understood. And Glastonbury, of course, is not just the chalice well or the so-called red spring. There's also the white spring. And there's numerous other springs in this town. It's, it's a town full of water resources. And, you know, it's, it would have been important. And of course, being slightly higher up as well, there would have been the ability to, you know, see the landscape, keep safe, all these kinds of things. And the ancient settlements here happened on the levels that surround us. It's a very um, kind of flat area. That's the sea level all around us, the marshes. And they would have been able to access food products and, and things like that from the water fish and shellfish because it was constantly flooded by the bristol channel which is of course the sea yes true and i've got visions of um I, one of my favorite books was mists of avalon and mm -hmm. when it was put into the adaptation of the television series where she parts the veils when she goes across the lake to avalon which is glastonbury yeah if, if um if you ever find yourself back in Glastonbury, because of course we met here many years ago, I would love to host you at my house because we have got that view. Come in the autumn because you are, the, the mist is a real thing here. Um, it kind of rolls in from the sea first thing in the morning. It's really low and then kind of rises as the sun comes out. And quite often it vanishes the entire landscape around here. And it still feels like we're on an island, which of course before the artificial draining of the marshlands to create some kind of, you know, food sources for the monks back in the Middle Ages. Um, this would have constantly been flooded and, and right now some of it is flooded. I'm looking down and it looks like there's a massive lake down there, but I know it's not a lake. It's, um, it's grazing land in the summer. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing. I do have another so, question <laughs> tying into the years of research and practice that you've been involved with your spiritual path. Mm -hmm. And again, tying into these pilgrimages, I just think it's wonderful that you've gone to so many sacred places. How has all these 
ventures and pilgrimages and sacred devotional work, how has that actually impacted upon your own beliefs, especially mm -hmm. over the years, looking back from when you started? And I'm thinking now for, since we're in an age of change, um, people might be wanting to do a little bit more devotional work, as you have just mentioned, even if it is just to their local water source. We don't need, we're not actually mm -hmm. worshipping water itself, but the embodiment, this Mm -hmm. turning something that's considered mundane into sacred how would you um start for somebody who's not familiar with any sort of devotional work so i've been really privileged um to be able to travel as much as i do my work allows that i've got a disabled son who i took on a huge trip about six years ago seven years ago i can't remember now um but of course, I do travel on a regular basis as well, just to visit these places. I think seeing the sites in person really brings it to life because you can see the size of it, the importance of it. And of course, you, you do need to go and look at the museums and read the history to understand it. But it does bring it to life. So going to ancient Eleusis or Delphi or to some of the, the amazing places I've been, you know, able to go to in other parts of the world, including Turkey, Greece, and um, even India, it really just brings it alive. And it kind of shows you the importance that these ancient gods, the practices, the beliefs had in everyday life. The temples, of course, often in city areas, but quite often also in more rural areas like I guess monasteries became later in kind of the Christian Europe, you know, kind of cut off from people spending time alone. Um, I think what it's done for me is it's brought to life the importance that these beings had in the ancient world in a different way. It sometimes paints a different picture on the ground of more diversity than maybe we would typically get from a book talking about modern paganism and the gods and stuff i think when you visit a lot of these sites you realize that the, the rules aren't quite so set in stone there was a lot of diversity the main thing that people had was respect you know there was a big respectful way of interacting with both the the space itself as well as the people of the space and the deities of the space. So kind of these different levels and also how they kind of looked after each other, how it all comes together and the importance of things that we just see as footnotes actually sometimes being much, much more important. So for me to be able to go to these sites and walk on the soil and drink from the water or stand in the water in the case of the Castalian Spring at Delphi, which is just incredible. Um, I think it has created like a connection somehow with the past, the present, but also the future. You know, I've had friends take photographs like in the same places that I took a photograph and send it to me on their own pilgrimages there. And you think there's this strange continuation through the ages. And at the Temple of Legina, of Hecate um, at Legina, which is a massive temple complex part of Stratonicea in um, the Carrion region of Turkey as well. This is an amazing phenomena, which I, I hope somebody takes up and researches properly one of these days. It's called plantum pe um, pedi. It's, it's, it's basically um, sacred feet. <laughs> um, there's the habit of, of people carving the outlines of their feet on the steps of the temple. And we don't know why this was done, but the best guess is that it's linked to an Essene cult in Egypt that spread into Europe via its connection. Isis was often linked to Artemis, Demeter, and also Hecate, because the three of these goddesses are sometimes very closely linked. And in fact, Isis and Hecate were sometimes merged into one goddess. So it's possible that this particular Egyptian cult where the priestesses would carve their feet after they finish their, their training, they mature, and they're leaving to go to a different temple somewhere else in the world. Back then, they never knew if they would actually ever return. 
this journey is a lot more perilous, they took much longer, etc. And life expectancy, of course, was much shorter. So this kind of connection and seeing these feet carved on the temple steps and whatever the reason behind them is, you know, like some of these actual examples of them being like this, going and maybe coming back, right? If if we follow the same pattern as this is in cult, which is I think likely, um, you just have this connection. You're standing in a place where somebody left their feet mark, quite literally, and you, you know you can put your own feet on top of it, and kind of feel that connection with somebody else standing there for whatever reason, but you know clearly considering the place sacred. Otherwise, they wouldn't be going through all of these steps to do that. Um, I think when you feel that connection to the past, but also to the present and the future in that way, you know, you, you realize just how fleeting our lives are and kind of how unimportant we are. We, we're not as important as we think we are. You know, we want to be the almighty and we want, want to have all the answers, mm -hmm. but we don't. And all we can do is learn from what people did before us and devotion not just to you know the, my goddess hecate but to to any of the gods devotion to as i said before the the natural world or to one another even you know not in a kind of strange way now but but just you know respect as it were and and really kind of valuing what we get from our friends from our family from our gods from our the spirits we believe in from our ancestral spirits and thinking about how we will be seen in the future. You know, what are we leaving in the world that makes a difference, that is gonna make people's lives better or change it. Even, you know, change can sometimes be difficult, right? So it's not just about giving warm and fuzzy feelings. And I think devotion is that thing that can connect us, you know, to the past and the future while still being in the present. It's this kind of, um, liminal space and it teaches us respect and it teaches us a lot more about ourselves you know going back to delphi there's that cliche man know thyself it was a cliche now but it was really important to you know the platonists and and all kinds of people this man know thyself i think devotion is is part of that journey of getting to know yourself and to learn what's important and what's not important and where to make your sacrifices but also where to put your boundaries with the world as a whole and where to put your energy and your time because there's nothing more precious that, that we've got than time you know we we can make more money and buy more bling <laughs> but we can never buy back our time you know so we've got these precious resources for ourselves and I think devotion is that thing that teaches us that it's important and that we've got to make the most out of it for ourselves, you know. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's also humbles us. As you said, it's, again, coming back to this, that we're not top of the food chain. We are this a minute part in the whole scheme of things. I could be listen to your adventures and your pilgrimages forever, but I we're coming to the end of our interview time, and I want to ask you a little bit about your publishing company, Avalonia oh. Books. What was the inspiration behind setting up your own company, and what mm. are some of the titles? And the reason I'm asking this is that you have a very special offer for our audience um, with your that you've got an offer yes so avalonia started well it kind of started as a community website that i had in the late 90s and by 2005 i was doing a lot of there was this whole revival in certain aspects of paganism and i was doing a lot of talks and public rituals and things like that at big conferences and people constantly asked me whether there was more information available on some of the topics and there were always some information but usually in another book and it kind of started off with kind of wanting to do a couple of very niche books 
and when I approached publishers about it, they inevitably were like, oh no, well, could you write us a 101 book about Wicca or pagan rituals or candle spells? It was like the thing in the early noughties. And I was like, mm, I don't really want to do that. I was writing for a very mainstream publication on those kinds of things already. Um, called Enhancing Your Mind, Body, Spirit, which kind of went international with Diagostini and, you know, one of those things that you collect every month and it was incredibly kind of all of those practical things. And I was like, no, I want to write about folklore and myth and very particular kind of more meaty subjects, you know, I want to put those things together for the few people that are asking. And they were like, yeah, but could you make it like more mainstream? <laughs> this is too niche and I was like yeah, okay fine I'm just going to publish it myself and at the time new options were becoming available for those of us that were web savvy and because I've already been involved in like internet things for a long time I kind of discovered print on demand and distribution and stuff like that through that so to begin with Avalonia back in 2005 when I published the first few books which is an Artemis, the Morrigan and a couple of other other topics I it wasn't really a business it was more like i'm just doing this because i want to get it out of my system and i want to spend time doing this and if i make back the cost of actually publishing it then i've got a copy um because i had another job um but then after the birth of my son i increasingly started getting requests from other people to publish their work and decided to just turn it into a publishing company and today we've got about a about a hundred titles in the catalogs so is still quite small i'm not planning on you know just taking on everything it tends to be things that really cover areas that isn't covered traditionally by other books some of it is people's personal experiences like the works of gary nottingham who's a practicing a practicing alchemist and magician living in the Welsh borders and it's literally his experience so it's very much written in the way that you would do if you got classes with him directly um, a fabulous series of books on ancient Egyptian gods by Leslie Jackson including Isis and Sahmet and Thoth but also more obscure things like Nut or Nuit the star goddess and the cobra goddess and she's working on more books in that same vein, um, books on theurgy, books on the grimoires, historical documents, as well as more practical books dealing with the practices that we have today, kind of the, the different um, niches, if you like, of Wicca and pra paganism and goddess traditions and stuff. And as you know, these things mutate into all kinds of corners and these niche books do really help um, people that are interested and of course i get to publish my own works as well um which includes circle for hecate hecate liminal rides a book on artemis and and several more <laughs> lots of books <laughs> it sounds a fantastic choice and i understand that for uh viewers if they go onto your website which will be listed below for any purchase over 35 pounds you're offering a five pound discount which is nearly 15 percent so it's very generous considering you're a very small business yeah but it's fun <laughs> it's fun to uh, and, and i think it's an important thing yes yes and i also understand that you have a second offer of a little mini course would you like to tell us I a little bit more that. about that so there'll be a little video course available as part of this event where I will be introducing how I do my household devotion here in the here and now today. I think that's wonderful. It's a good starting place for people who mm -hmm. are a little bit unfamiliar with devotional work, what it involves, and it's something that they could move into whatever spiritual path that they're following mm -hmm. as yeah. well. You can so, adapt it, yes, yes definitely. Yeah. Wonderful. As I said, the links will be below this recording. So, Sarita, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francis, for having me. Lovely yes. talking to you. And it's my pleasure as well. Your talk has been so inspiring, makes me want to dust off that passport and get <laughs> travelling now that the world's beginning to open up again. So thank you very much for sharing your wisdom with us.
and to but <laughs> and to everybody who is watching Natalila, thank you. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I have, and I look forward to seeing you again. Blessings. <laughs>